Hello everybody, welcome to Cairo, Egypt and this is where my Mahindra adventure begins. Of course, I've never been to Cairo, Egypt before. This is my first time, so I'm very excited. And this Mahindra Scorpio S11 4x4 will be my office for the next six days. Let me take you through what this adventure is all about. Now you'll already have seen in part one of this journey some of the amazing things Renuka got to do including visiting the city of Alexandria, a cruise on the Nile, seeing the Great Pyramids and one I really regret missing, dune bashing in the Sahara. But I was promised that I too had an action-packed adventure in store. It started however much like most mornings for me back home, threading the Scorpio through Cairo's bustling rush hour. But soon we were able to break away from all of that and get out onto the open road. Well, it's my first day on the road and what a great initiation it's been. I started off in Cairo city, which reminds me a lot of any of our cities in India. A lot of chaos, traffic darting in and out, no lane discipline, but well, I guess I'm used to it. But since we got out of the city, it's been a lot easier. We're on a 500 kilometer drive today from Cairo to Hurghada. And right now I'm on this incredibly wide highway. It's got six lanes on either side, so a total of 12 and we're currently cruising at triple digit speeds with not a care in the world. We soon caught our first glimpse of the next big natural attraction, the Red Sea. This massive body of water in the midst of all this desert is a blue blessing and an inlet of the Indian Ocean it is home to quite a diverse set of marine life. It's also what has made today's destination so very popular. Unlike most of the stops on this adventure so far, this one isn't a marvel of ancient history. Once a humble fishing village, Hurghada has since transformed into a very modern and very luxurious tourist destination thanks to its abundance of beaches along the Red Sea coast. It's alive with nightlife and luxury hotels that will give you access not just to the crystal clear water, but to water sports, snorkeling and even scuba diving. It's a good thing our schedule let us laze around a little longer in Hurkara the next morning as it gave us a chance to soak up the sun and sand before hitting the road. Well, after that really relaxed morning in Hurghada and the Red Sea, I feel like I should have stayed back in the hotel and had another nap, quite frankly. But I'm glad to be back on the road again. Today, we're driving to the very famous city of Luxor. And it's a much shorter drive than yesterday, just under 300 kilometers. So we should be there just a little late for lunch, which is fine by me, frankly. For now, however, what we've got is a nice focus straight and very smooth highway in fact all i want to do right now is stretch this scorpio's legs because there's just so much road spread out in front of me but i gotta keep an eye on those speed limits they can get quite strict and they have been pulling over drivers for over speeding so i think i gotta keep things under control and of course the easiest way to keep things under control especially on a big open highway like this is to use the cruise control, which of course the Scorpio is equipped with. With kilometer upon kilometer of desert expanse, however, we decided it was best to take a break for a cup of some very strong Egyptian tea, also called chai by the way. gave us a glimpse of what the local equivalent of a roadside dhaba was like. And you gotta admit, there is a certain familiarity to it all. Wasn't long before we had to rush back to the road because after that late start, we had to make it to our next destination, which was quite a special one. Well, here we are in Luxor and if there's a lot of noise in the background, I do apologize because, well, it's a pretty big bustling city and we're right in the heart of it right now. But we're in the heart of it for a good reason. Right there, the big temple, mosque and 
I'm told a chapel as well of Laksa. Uh, and we're gonna go see that soon, just after we have a quick bite of some very nice local fare. We were worried that we wouldn't get a proper chance to see the Lagza temple as the sun went down, but quite to the contrary, we were advised that it looks its best by night under the specially designed spotlights that really bring out the detail and craftsmanship. And they were right. With its larger-than-life statues, pylons and obelisks, the Luxa temple is truly a sight to behold. What strikes you most is the variety, as it was renovated by many pharaohs over several dynasties, starting with Amenhotep III in about 1319 BC, Tutankhamun and even Ramses II. There's even a shrine dedicated to Alexander the Great that was built almost a thousand years later. And yes, since it was used as a place of worship by so many dynasties, generations and civilizations, it does indeed house a mosque and a chapel, in addition to the main Egyptian temple. Just outside the temple is the Avenue of Sphinxes, a 3 km long road leading up to the Karnak temple that's lined with, you guessed it, Sphinxes. 1,350 of them in fact, or however many remain to this day. It's a site we would revisit later on. The next morning, we were in for a bit of a surprise. It started with a serene boat ride across the Nile to watch the sunrise. And if that wasn't enough, over the horizon we saw a colourful pattern emerge. Hot air balloons can be magnificent and terrifying at the same time. On one hand, they're larger than life vehicles that will fill you with wonderment and awe. And on the other, well, you're floating in a basket thousands of feet in the air. But once we got to cruising altitude, the views were absolutely breathtaking. Now they told us at the very start of this trip that shooting with a drone in Egypt would be close to impossible and that was a bit of a bummer but thankfully we've got quite frankly something even better than that today. We are in the drone, we are in a hot air balloon flying over the west bank of the Nile looking at all the tombs of the pharaohs which they call the valley of the kings and of course the tombs of the queens called the valley of the queens. It is truly spectacular. Back down on terra firma and still in the Luxor region, we then made our way to the Karnak temple which began, as we'd learned the night before, at the other end of the Avenue of Sphinxes. Now yesterday we got to see the temple of Luxor by night. And today we've come a few kilometers down the road to this, the Temple of Karnak. Now while it is a little bit larger than the Temple of Lagza, it even has its own lake, what really sets this one apart is the time it took to build this. It started over 4,000 years ago and spanned various Egyptian dynasties and there even is some Roman influence thrown in for the mix. But right now, what I like the most about this place is the fact that it's 40 degrees outside and I am cool as a cucumber thanks to the shade provided by these 25 meter high columns. It's absolutely brilliant. That's what strikes you about Karnak, the scale. Covering an area of about 200 acres, it's not just a temple, it's a complex of temples that took over 2,100 years to complete. Later that evening, we reached Aswan, the last big city on our journey. It's famous for its souk or street market, which made for an interesting way to get amongst the locals. But this was merely a pit stop to the last big attraction we would visit, the following morning. Well, here we are, the last day of this adventure and I'm really, really sad about that because it's gone by in such a flash. Now, it's not completely over yet. Today, we're on our way to Abu Simbel and that promises to be really, really spectacular. In fact, our guide tells us it will be the best attraction of everything we've seen on this trip. 
But frankly, I find that quite hard to believe because gosh, have we seen a lot of really incredible stuff on this authentic Egypt journey. There was Alexandria, the Egyptian Museum, there was dune bashing, of course the Great Pyramids of Giza and the Sphinx, there was Luxor, there was Karnak and there was that fantastic hot air balloon ride. So really, this is going to take a lot for it to top all those things. But it's not just the wonders of the world and all these attractions that make Egypt so endearing and so charming. It's just the everyday mundane things that you can only notice on a long drive like this. The way people interact with you, the way you interact with people, the kind of shops there are, the kind of food there is, the kind of things you get to experience. It's all very unique. We've been to a lot of places over the years, but this is something quite different from everywhere else. Quite different, but also quite familiar if you're from India because there are a lot of commonalities between the Indian people and the Egyptian people. My favorite of which, of course, is the fact that we both have long and storied histories. While for some Western countries, a few hundred years seems like a lot. For us, it's a few thousand. And of course, the other thing you'll learn about on a long drive like this is the car you're in. Now, I know the Scorpio quite well. I tested it quite extensively when it came to us in Mumbai. But there's nothing, and I mean nothing, like living with a car over several thousand kilometers. I know this sounds a bit cliched, but this car has grown on me. It's formed an impression, just like my scrawny frame has probably formed an impression in this driver's seat. Now, Mahindra of late has delivered a lot of really impressive new cars, but quite frankly, I don't think I'd rather do such a trip in anything other than a Scorpio, particularly a Scorpio 4x4, because, you know, dune bashing in the desert, right? It's big, it's tough, and it gives you that all-conquering sense of discovering a new land, and that's exactly what we've been doing. It's been a fun expedition, and I'm gonna hate to see it end. That thought lingered in my head until we pulled up to the nondescript parking lot outside Abu Simbel, where there wasn't a statue, temple or sphinx in sight. A short walk later, I realized why. Concealed by the mountain was the temple of Ramses II, built by Ramses II for Ramses II. Reigning between 1279 and 1213 BC and possibly the most famous pharaoh of them all, he fancied himself to be a god. And yes, all four of those statues are in his likeness. Inside the hieroglyphs depicts stories from his life in vivid detail and a little further down is a smaller temple dedicated to his favourite wife Nefertari. But don't worry, he features prominently there too. The most fascinating thing about Abu Simbel, however, is that it wasn't always located here. In 1968, it was moved piece by piece to higher ground to prevent it being flooded by the lake. What's most amazing about these ancient structures in Egypt is that they're just out there for everyone to experience up close and personal. Sure, a lot of time and effort goes into preserving and restoring it all, but most of it isn't tucked away behind a glass display or a velvet rope. You can see it, walk amongst it and feel it. And that really puts one of the world's most ancient civilizations into perspective. It's a special place, Egypt. One I highly recommend visiting at least once in your life. And if it's possible, do it from behind the wheel of a car.